academic and it's theater, and the place where they both meet. We have the audience and the participants for each other. International practice is historical practice is cultural practice. Samples of women sharing what it is that you do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you can ignore that signals anymore. Or come all on and you can come and see and talk about it. Starts out on the whole thing, you like it there, you have to be completely open. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's just what should be done. And indeed, my understanding of life, relationships, death, has already changed. The survival of theater as an art form depends on that. So um, welcome everybody to the Martin Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke, I'm the director of the Siegel Center. This is a great day for us. It's the beginning of the readings of the Ten World Voices Play Festival. We are doing this for over 10 years. It's an incredible honor for us to work with this sig truly significant and important organization that has Freedom to Rights program, gives us the most significant literary awards, but also now created that uh, literary festival that is, uh, I think, unrivaled in the United States. Um, Penn uh, Festival was created by Paul Auster, Salman Rushdie, and Michael Roberts at the time of uh, George Bush, uh, their son, and when they felt there was a tunnel vision in America. It looks now that it was like the great old conservative time, so <laughs> things have changed radically, but I think the basic idea still is the same. Um, they said 95% of all books are English books or come from England or the US. The rest 5%, half of it is German or French because it's government subsidies help for translation. So you have one or two books that comes from the 180 or 200 countries around the world, and it would be unthinkable for musicians not to listen to music from all around the world, to be influenced, to want to know um, what, uh, what people are working on, and I think this festival makes an incredible contribution. Check out the website. It's going on this week. week. It's, I think, a fantastic lineup. Lots of <coughs> events are free like ours. Um, we had an opening uh, last uh, evening. Normally we invite writers from all around the world, from different continents, minority languages. <coughs> this time we said we invite the Gorky Theater, Berlin. It's a sensational theater in Berlin. It's uh, what people say the most innovative, most experimental, somehow the youngest with audience and ideas, creating new forms of theater for the new times um, we live in. Um, the uh, Turkish-German uh, 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 leader, uh, Sherman Langhoff and uh, Jens, who they work together with, they create an ensemble. Basically, everybody is um, uh, not the typical like German like me, you know, so they are come from all the countries, you know, that pe pe refugees come or immigra immigrants or first generation immigrations and just also artists who work, but they are uh, giving a home, a safe haven, and they really do uh, engage with stories that have never been told on the stages. You hear parallel languages on stage, and they develop the work in a hi very highly unusual way, in collaborative works, actors, directors together, and we have the privilege to show six of uh, the most, some of the most interesting plays over the, um, I think, seven or eight years that theater is there. If you're ever in Berlin, please do go, and um, I think it is truly a uh, uh, something inspirational, and uh, it's the first time they come to the US, it's the first time these plays got three of them translated, the first time that they are shown, so now you are here at the very beginning, and you can say I was there, and there was the very first uh, Gorky reading at the Siegel, or in the US, or in the Americas. So um, uh, we have the playwright with us, Sivan, who wrote this play, Daddy Loves You. <laughs> and, uh, Sivan flew all the way over here uh, to be with us and talk with us next to her, Nora, the other player, and Christopher from the Gorky, and um, so we will talk afterwards um, a little bit. And then there's Tina, the director I see somewhere. They are still in there. Tina Center, we will see a great New York director uh, from uh, uh, Experimental Theater, downtown Walt, here she is. And now, Daddy loves you, and uh, thank you for coming. If you have a cell phone, now is the time to take it out, and please do check it's off. I'll do the same. Thank you. 
Daddy loved you by Savan bin Yishai. Let the blood come out to show them, part three. You know what you are going to write about, but in the end, you always land next to your mother. They paid two euros 80 for the ride. Since then, sitting on the bench, the queens, the many, not in front of them. Me, sitting in front of them after a long night with you. You, probably already at home now with dad, sitting on your side of the sofa while he's sitting on his. You're covered with a little blanket, playing an internet game in your smartphone. Assuming that Papa Loves You will play in the theater around 20.30 in the evening, you've already had your dinner. After dad goes to bed, you will take another plate of food and swallow it in the darkness while standing alone next to the countertop. I will never tell you what I've written about you, and if you ask, I will explain to you that the mother in the piece is a metaphor for homeless. He is sitting on his side of the sofa. His smartphone is leaning on one of the pillows. His iPad is lying in his lap. His eyes are looking to the TV screen Soon he will ask for, and we will bring him, a bottle of cola and a glass. He will drink half of the bottle and burp. I wonder if when he does it now, you two still laugh like you used to. We never existed. Me. You. When a train is driving full power one direction, and the human body is sitting in it, still, being transported from point A to point B, staring at the time and space fleeting in front of its eyes. The driver is far away, no answer. The train rolls down the tunnel like a ring, swallowed by mistake, tumbled through the curves of an intestine, silent in the carriages, in one carriage especially. Early morning, the train is almost empty. On the bench sits a woman. On her head, she's wearing a hat, and the hat has the color of her suit and her suit has the color of her orthopedic shoes, and her orthopedic shoes has the color of the three napkins that are peeking out of her blazer pocket. What can a woman with a hat that matches the suit that matches the shoes that match the napkins do? <laughs> what can she do? She can sit, she can stare forward at her own reflection, on the dark windows in front of her, in front of her, trapped within her reflected silhouette, sitting, for real, I am sitting alone in front of Miss Hat, in front of Grandma Suit. And so early is this morning, and very long is the night, and I hump my eyes onto her, and I drop my eyes from her, and I raise my eyes, and I move my eyes, and I roll my eyes, and I close my eyes, and I open them back. And in front, two now sit, two Grandma Hats are expectorating simultaneously coughing into one, two, three napkins and three colors, held by three pairs of hands. Yes, in front of me, there are four lady suits sitting, one next to another, next to another, and another one. And the suits match the bracelets, and the bracelets fit the pantyhose, five pairs of pantyhose, one, two, six, nine hats, and belt in a row on the carriage's bench, nine suits. Suits of the kind that the Queen of England would wear, the Queen of England, Elizabeth, what's her name? Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> queen Elizabeth. What is she doing, by the way? What's her job? What does a queen do at all? <laughs> Between us, the carriage's aisle. People jump once in a while in and out of the carriage. All of them pause, smiling, in front of the spectacle. They all probably find it kind of poppy, sort of contemporary. Nine queens captured in an iron bubble of light, tens of meters under the ground, squeezed into ignoring your look. I see you there. The dark middle, the dark night of the deep middle of a story. The beginning of the rise is far behind, unreachable, and the end is unseen. Certain, but concealed. One can crash into it full speed without even seeing it coming. A fly bumping into a pane of glass. End 
Trains arrive only when they want to. Final station, too. And when this final station draws near, it will appear as a little light in the distance that indicates the tunnel is over. And it's an absolute cliche, of course, but this is how it will start, a light in the dark, etc., etc. From this moment on, the closer the train gets to the tiny flash of light, the bigger the light will become, not something dramatic, just simple mathematics. The closer one gets to an object, the bigger it seems. And indeed, when the train finally stops, it will be standing in front of a big square of light three times bigger than the train itself. And this square of light won't be a regular exit doorway or a normal train station, you know. It will be a huge, squared, empty frame. A screen, a picture, a monitor that comes at the end of a long black sleeve. And if you push your head towards the monitor and wait, from the right, look, a long-haired woman enters. And the woman, she is riding her bike. The bike is so rusty that you can hear the rattling of the chain. The woman's shin muscles are swollen and glitter in the sun. Yes, the sun is in the picture too. And behind her, on her pannier rack, cross-legged, sits a man, giggling, excited. He is hugging her waist from behind in order not to fall, while she, calm and concentrated, is pedaling further, pedaling forward. And it's only her in this squared frame at the end of the tunnel. It's only her in this picture. It's her, and it's his laugh that rolls from afar. And it's you, watching them if you've managed to get to this point. And it's me, too. The woman on the bike rides through the picture, crossing in its middle, and at some point, she disappears. Maybe she noticed, maybe she didn't, that behind her, a flock of women are coming. They, too, are pedaling their bikes, and each one of them is carrying a young, blushing man who hugs her waist firmly from behind, holding her tight in order not to fall, and as they take a sharp turn at a huge junction, all the women lean their bikes low into the corner, and the picture unfolds and stretches and opens and becomes three-dimensional, and all the women are waving their hands at a tall woman who stands at the junction, waiting for the traffic light to change. The woman throws warm greetings at each and every cyclist that passes her, and after they all disappear, she sends her big veined hand backwards grab the thin, gentle fingers of her partner. Mm -hmm. And when the traffic light turns green, she'll lead them through the humming streets. He skips and runs behind her, trying to follow her huge steps, left, then right, and right, then left. And a few more streets forward, she leads them beyond the people and beyond the streets and beyond the noise. And he follows with dreamy eyes, always half a meter behind her as he was never especially good with directions, and she, she's never wrong. And so they end up quickly and mistakelessly on the bank of the canal, and they hug tightly, as they both understand that she has brought them to where the summer is celebrating its best days, where all is euphoria, where everybody is moving, living, crashing into each other in the air like dizzy bugs in love grass and water and marmalade, and the water shimmers in the evening sun. And along the water line, a group of heavyweight boxers with colorful sports bras are running and singing together to the common rhythm of their feet. And with every planting of their huge feet on the ground, the ground shakes a little, and the trees tremble a little, and the birds above them panic a little, spreading all around them and creating astounding shapes of birds in the sky like sand that changes its shape with the beat of a drum, and drums, and drums, and women assemble in big and small circles all around, applauding and cheering the breakdancing girls in the middle, shouting and encouraging light and heavyweight ladies who wrestle in the water, roar with joy, while naked children are everywhere, <clears throat> floating in the air around them, touching, not touching, like fluffy sea heads. And once in a while, they find their mothers and get entangled in their hair, dragging them, laughing, into the water. And the mothers, the mothers respond with a spontaneous somersault in the air 
and like long stretched arrows they slice the water, throwing their wet bras to the bank and swim with strong rowing movements, their skin shining in the sun like the glowing backs of free whales in the heart of the ocean, while the few fathers on the shore hand little magnifying glasses to the children. And they all watch together how their mothers race each other. And they cheer them and miss them very much, but they'll have to wait patiently until the mothers come back, wet and panting, shaking their hair and skin like huge wet hairs. <coughs> and all around the applause rises and rises. All around the applause is rising. And if you look to your sides, you'll see that everyone around you is standing, tall and stretched and glowing like a field of sunflowers looking towards the sky. Because at the top of the picture, a long, black-bearded, naked woman is cutting the air like a jet plane. And she might be God, but we can really leave God now to the side. We could really talk about God in another time, because now, in this picture, a black-bearded, naked woman is crossing the sky with a roar. And she flips in the air and lets out thunder shouts. And until she disappears from their sight, they won't stop waving at her. Hours they will remain like that, shining all together, shirtless, nipples in all colors, flashing like lucky stars, and dancing and dancing, throwing their bodies into the air for her, for each other, for everything, turning around in endless Sufi circles, long hair dangling from their armpits like hungry, dripping tongues, and pubic hair bursting from their crotches like fire coming out of lion's mouths. And around every woman dancing under the sky, there's someone sucking her neck and sucking her lips. This is why all the women are covered with love spots, pink and red and black lipstick leopard spots. All the naked bodies on the lake are covered with them. And the lovely sounds surrounding the picture are rocking the strong female bodies from inside and from outside. Pathos here is mostly welcome. Welcome tears and welcome wailings. Welcome trembling organs. Welcome. And the sun is so soft. And the sun, it is already close to its sunset. And like a cat, the sun rubs itself between the women's breasts, between their curves, rolling and pressing its beams on their tanned backs in a last little massage for the last time. And this is the sign to disperse. The men carry the warm, sleepy children on their chests. And the women walk together, hugging sisters, and their heavy breasts leave a trail behind them on the sand as they walk, reading poetry and philosophy to each other. Yes, words are the sound, are the loud, are the laughter. Train news. Train news. What does an old woman have between the breasts that a young woman doesn't? A name. News, news, train news. What do an 80-year-old woman and a 14-year-old girl have in common? They both want to look 20. End of news. What do you call the gynecologist of a grandma? Archaeologist? And after all, it's a picture. And this picture, it's an exit station, a final station. And it's there, waiting, being shown in loops on this square monitor far away from here. Or maybe very close, I don't know. Ends arrive when they decide to. I said that already. Final stations, too. All night, we were there. Dad called. You're in a hospital, fast, come fast. It's her belly, her kidneys, stones again, blood in the urine. They must operate, come immediately. <clears throat> Emergency room, and I come. In the middle of the night, I come, and I run, and I see you. You, through the half-open door. You, sitting alone on the hospital bed before your operation. And you're just one mother out of thousands. I know. And you're just one mother out of millions that are sitting now on the hospital bed. I know, but how can I explain? It's my mother. Listen, it's my mother. Train. Are driving only forward, but can see only back. So back now. Back to the carriage, back to the bench, on which nine Queen Elizabeths sit, fastened to each other. Above their heads, above their heads, a sign with clear behavioral rules for this train to ride. One, don't look each other in the eyes. Two, you may share an uncontrollable smile regarding an unusual phenomenon in the carriage, but make sure that the smile is gone after a maximum of three to four seconds. Three, you may stare at dogs, but their lips, their voices, their skin, their looks, 
their cups, their damp napkins, their little bags, ignoring the books. Nine different colors diffusing into each other. One gray mass with nine crowns on top. And underneath, underneath waits the bare skin. Cha, cha, cha. Regarding gravity, all things with mass are brought toward one another. First dance class. Cha, shake. Turn. Now look down in the other direction. Jump. And now down to the ground that pulls your skin, queens. Whoosh. The ground, the earth, that exhausts you to death, queens. Choosh. I see the earth drawing your skeletons down, queens. I see it arm wrestling with you, asking for your body, for your bones, for your bones. And you think you're on top, queen, but soon the ground will win. You think you're on top, queen, but at the end, the ground will win. You know it. I know it. You know it. But until then, human jaws don't stop. The heavy breath, hop, hop, open the old toothless hole. Acapella, all together. Nine queens flying under waters. Nine queens swimming underground. Through the half-opened door crack. I'm looking at you. A bent little body left on its own. How can I explain alone with your body? How can I explain marinated in your pain? What happened to you? Your own hand pinches the brown age stains on top of the other. When did they all appear, Mama? How can I explain through the half-opened door I see you, a gray, tiny woman sitting on this bed? How can I explain? It wasn't you. Life treated us well, if we're to be honest. Although we were always somehow afraid of the future, now we can look back clearly and say that life has always treated us well. As if we were an unproblematic, quiet pupil whom the teachers wouldn't harass. Life didn't harass me. Death, sickness, poverty, problems, cancer, Alzheimer, hate, accidents, loss. I was this well-behaved pupil. I was the awkward one lifting the last chair after everybody's already gone. Cleaning the board for the teacher. Wrinkles, scars. They haven't erased our faces because life, it meant no harm. Wagon tails, 18 tired eyes, I count them, empty hungry bowls, nine mouths, nine dripping the broken eye holes. It's the silence in the carriage that makes it hard to breathe. Or it's the sealed dark windows. They are wrapping us blindfold. The train is flying a hundred kilometers per hour flying. Yet here, time and space seem frozen. Don't worry, honey. You say good that you're here. You say no one has arrived yet. Good that you're here. Hey, don't worry. It's a simple procedure. You say, look at you. You say, always the first. You say, you were always our first. And before I enter surgery, you say, I'm going to give you my teeth. You say, I'd like to put them in this little box and I'm going to give you my teeth. Will you keep them for me? You say, you say, after the operation, you need to promise me that you will be the first one to enter my room, you say, and give me my teeth back. Then you give me my teeth back, and don't let father in, you say, before my teeth are in, you say. Don't let him see me without the teeth. Under the milky fluorescent lights, I see her bottom lip is trembling. Our legs are moving, it means a lot. In truth, 
This lake was never particularly remarkable. Was never particularly hairy, or particularly long, or particularly big, or particularly short, or particularly hurt, or particularly vain. This lake was normal, was smooth, was white, was never run over by a car, was never forced by the weight of naked male limbs on it, or squashed into the asphalt with violence. This lake was never pulled and lifted by hands of soldiers, of policemen, of teenagers who wanted something from it. This lake was always relatively safe. Life didn't sharpen its nails on our backs, not in passion and not in attack. Life didn't lick the blood out of our necks. We weren't the beauties, but we didn't become Dracula's victims either. Life didn't suck us dry, and the horrible stuff was not so horrible. Mothers, fathers, simple stories. We never allowed them to crash on us with their full weight. Life was soft to us, and we thanked the world and avoided extra risks. We were the well-behaved pupils. Our metaphorical notebooks were perfect. We came ready to the classroom, and we did it day after day. Punctually, we did it diligently. True, never in the brilliant one's role. We were never the academic, the celebrity, the professor, the artist, the writer, but had no problem with that, because life, it took care. Regarding the wagon that has forgotten all about us while we are sitting in it, second dance class. From the left to the right, nine babies. Nine babies. With orthopedic shoes and tired skin. Find a partner. Bow. Look at you. Nine grown-up babies sitting in a row. From the left to the right, nine babies. Nine babies. With tits. Little bend. Gray hair. Switch hands. Nine exhausted babies with past stories and bitterness, wrinkles. Nine babies mowed by time, nine babies with wigs and colored lips, anonymous babies sitting helpless in a train, and the train passes through a tunnel like a finger through water, leaves no trace, no evidence. Who will remember you, my queens? Even the train itself has already forgotten about you while you were sitting in it. Even the train has already forgotten one ride in one direction. That's what you get. We're trying again. Find a new partner. All night long. They were digging your belly with their knives and scissors all night, pushing their hands to, to the infected hole that once upon a time farted me out all night. Behind the door, in the waiting room, the little box with your teeth shakes between my fingers like a trapped bird. Not too many strong memories from the wars we went through. And we guess that we'll already be dead when the atom bombs soon start falling on your heads. We haven't suffered too much. True, there were a few years back then which were a bit less pleasant, but first of all, we really don't remember too much of them, and secondly, I made sure that I got the full extended package of compensations for each and every war trauma that I ever went through. <laughs> and the not so tiny amount that was deposited to my bank account every beginning of every month for the last 30 years compensated me very kindly for any kind of suppressed, forgotten trauma that I may be, might have, experienced in this war or another. I'm not saying that the war was nice, but one must look at things with perspective, simple mathematics. The closer to it you are, the bigger it seems. My life was always soft to me, and even when it was a bit less soft, it was still worth it. If we settle the account and check what we gave and what we received, we came out on top. We're not saying that everybody was as lucky with this war as we were, but we managed to squeeze the system till the last cent. Eh, 
after I was done with them. They were sorry for uprooting my father's golden teeth from his mouth and stealing my mother's business and fortune. Every person should leave their house and belongings, take only one suitcase with them, and jump into the train. Minorities of today, listen to me. I know that these days are bad for you. Believe me, been there, done that. But let me tell you something as an ex-minority that has seen some things in her life. The cost of a dress <clears throat> divides itself forever into the future. Think about it. A 100 euro dress is not so expensive if you are going to wear it 600 times. Back to the suitcase. Although my family and I had to leave everything we had behind us, in the end I got so many compensations and benefits from the state as a result of this war that my future was practically fixed. I can't help but think today that this little suitcase was actually quite an investment. I tortured the system that murdered my family until it gave me everything that I deserved by law. So yes, you are not having a great time now, true. I see you, I know what you're going through. But in the end, they will learn. And not because we will teach them humanism, but because they will feel it in their pockets, and in their second generation's pockets, and in their third generation's pockets. They'll pay until they learn. And that's what I'm trying to say. They paid me a lot. And please, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to drag anyone to rebel against any system. No, no, that's not my idea. I was never against any system. I never wanted to ruin systems. I'm actually a big fan of the system. I don't believe in going against. I don't believe in fighting. I see you activists. <laughs> you think that you're big heroes, then you get the crabs. <laughs> All the full of sorrow, tortured souls, they died before me. In their wars, in their demonstrations, in their diseases, in their great art. We had this kind of basic luck. After the war, we flew 3,000 kilometers away and landed in a brand new place, this time as a majority, in the democratic land of those who are in the majority. We admit that there is a tiny logical problem in the last sentence, but we aren't the ones who formulated it. It's not our fault. There was nothing we could do. Cancer, cancer, Krebs! If one is to be born, then better at the right time in history. And preferably when democracy is on your side. I had electricity, water. A bullet never met my head. No detentions and bombardments in the middle of the night. No leaders calling me to kick me out of my house. We were okay. Generally, we were okay. The army was on our side. We had basic human rights. Even the men in our lives, they didn't destroy us. It was all good. No horrible traumas. No one dragging you by the hair. No cruel gang bangs. No horrors. No attacks in the street in the middle of the night. And just to make it clear, I was never against gangbangs and dragons and all that. I just knew where to place them in my life. They were placed in my head, in the little Schlaustunde afternoon while no one was at home. Home. I had a home. It's a lot. I had a mother. Until I reached the age of 50, I had a mother. It's a lot. I had a father, too. He used to come to my house for every lunch for 15 years after Mama's death, replaced her kitchen with mine. The sharper pencils in the audience might make the connection and understand that this habit of his of gotten the way of my afternoon orgasm delights, but yeah. In the end, one after the other, they all disappeared from our lives. All the fathers, the mothers, the husbands, after they left, we found ourselves alone, finishing the days with a glosh and a whiskey in one hand, half of a raw onion in the other, for the immune system 
wailing in front of dirty gangbangs from hell. Train news. Train news. An elderly widowed gentleman in a nursing home became very friendly with an elderly lady. He told her his former wife used to hold his penis every night to help him go to sleep. Commercials, commercials, train news. The elderly lady decided to do this for her new male friend every night for a week. Each night he fell soundly asleep. The next week, the gentleman told the lady that he was sorry, but he had found a new partner. She asked him, sad, sad, what does she have, have, that I don't have? Have, he replies, Parkinson. <laughs> end of sad news. <laughs> and you, <laughs> on your back, you, early, early morning, the opened mouth you, they pushed their hands in you, then further they sent you, done, next. But my mother, listen, it's my mother, the under anesthesia, toothless you, they're probably pushing your bed somewhere, the rolling, fainted, brawless you, where are they taking you? They don't even know you. In our job, too, we tried to do our best. Several times we even got promoted. My boss, he was a great, talented man. In addition to his work in the office, he was an amateur hairdresser. What a great hand he had. For 22 years, once a month, after everybody had left the office, we used to put on our special high heel shoes and on a swivel chair in the special meetings room he used to cut our hair. A perfect haircut, everything included. Washing, shampooing, cutting, drying. Perfect treatment until he came on my back. Always cleaned us after offered a cigarette. Even now, every now and then, he still pops up in my mind, this man. He is dead, 15 years already, such a great hairdresser and great listener. <laughs> Where are they, the great listeners, in these times of narcissism? Everybody's mad, crazy, lonely planet set on fire. So many speakers and no one listens. So many performers and who is sitting over there in the audience to watch them all. It's so nice to know that somewhere in my past, in front of a huge window of an empty office, under the stars, there is an aging woman sitting, elegantly dressed, and she is me. And she's talking and talking, while behind her stands a man, and he is fully listening to her. Under the stars, she talks, he listens, and massages her skull. Well, with his left hand. <laughs> and the main hero, the exposed flesh, cottage, dance prom. And the silence in the carriage. They exhale it, I inhale it. Hard to breathe within the carriage. They exhale it, I inhale it. Nine queens. My nine queens. Gaze on their skin. My nine queens. And how old, and how the bellies, and how wide, and how chests. What does a grandma have between the nipples? A navel. Chop. A navel. <laughs> this gaze removes everything, removes every defense, removes every cover. And now, on your feet, queens. Chop. Straighten your legs, queens. <laughs> and start to remove, remove those ridiculous clothes from those barely breathing chests, one by one. Remove them. Just take off the suits, your suits, to the sound of the shaking wheels. Get naked now to the screech of the metal whistles. Take them off now to the smash of the doors. Take everything off your bodies, the shoes, wigs, 
take them off and leave them on the floor in piles. Freeze. The suits in a pile here, the shoes put in a pile on the other side, the glasses, here's the pile for them, throw on your socks, you won't need them, take everything off, get naked, all those bras, clips, use napkins, take them off, and now naked, completely naked, stand in the middle of the carriage. In a row, nine queens in a row, sit the mini. Terrified, naked silkworm cocoons, the butchery shop of the female body, and the train goes on to the corridors, the corridors of the elementary school, commemoration day of the murdered and the victims of the national wars, and we, seven-year-old school children, standing in front of 70-year-old photos, in which women raise their hands in front of soldiers, in front of guns, the women, the naked, the armpits, the faces, distorted by fear, or maybe it's the freezing wind. Women, women, women standing together under waters, under wars, young and old and female and bodies alive or dead, piles of nudity, dust and body color. The peep show of history has exposed their skin for 70 years already, 70 years and the walls are full with the female bellies and the female breasts, over 70 years exhibited in photos. And on the bottom of every photo of every naked woman raising her hands, the government's logo. The women's hands cover themselves from the soldiers' laughs, from the soldiers' guns, from the soldiers' eyes, and maybe from our eyes, too. The pixels of the past suffering. Seven-year-old children look now at a real adult nipple for the first time in their lives, moving, hectic, from one photo to another, seeking one in which to see better, a photo in which the hands weren't able to to cover the movie that became national, that became official, that became legal to view. Yearly ceremonies, and it's been years now that the women have been exhibited, their nudity caught and portrayed forever, black and white and four corners of a photo, and in its center, nine women stand in a row. Eighteen hands are raised in the air, knees collapsing into one another, and we children assembled around it hypnotized. And what we see? nipples and terrified eyes, and what we see, distorted ribs and shaved feminine skulls, and what we see, limbs and sharpened pelvic, bone, pelvic bones, toothless gaping mouths, bodies that are thrown dead on one another, a pile, and shoe piles, and suit piles, and glasses piles, and wigs, tens and tens of litters of exposed flesh being hung on the walls, the private flesh, tens and tens and liters of female exposed flesh that was peeled from its covering layers. All of this softness, all of this softness, the peep show of memorizing the person, history, turn, of the one with the terrified eyes, lift up, who has made the mistake and covered her crotch with two hands so her breast remained exposed forever. You always hid your body from us. You never showed your breasts. You said that they were ugly and refused to be photographed. My queen, your face close to mine, panting. You used to scream when Papa wasn't there. You closed the windows and slapped and slapped. Your dry lips, stench of unfresh saliva. At some point, I started to hit back, Mama. Crawling up the stairs to your room, an old chameleon, crawling in slow motion, licking your dessert, colorless lips. The smell. You didn't like to drink water, and your mouth shriveled, got brown, withered, drooped, and was never kissed again. In a modern house, in the heart of the city with a job, a career, good friends, and a great family, you lived in a cave. In a modern house, in the heart of the city, with a short haircut and a feminist education, you were the one that rotted, and your clothes became wider and darker and stretched on your heavy meat. A woman can become three things when she grows old, he said. A cow, a chicken, or a goat. 
while I was doubting which one of the three I will become, father's car entered the parking lot and you shut the TV down. Silence. Papa needs his quiet when he arrives from work. Papa works hard for us and the evenings belong to Papa. And the door opens and Papa's in the house and Papa. He wears white cloaks and Papa, he goes for long walks, master of the land, and has deep talks, a count and a sir, a gentleman, and breathes fresh air and nature, then lights a cigarette, always at the right moment, always of the best kind. You smoked the cheapest and devoured two packs a day. My sweet moves are sour, biting your fingernails to the bone, preparing the daily food. How can I explain the food that feeds? He cooked only on special occasions, and when he did, he cooked with all the colors, and when he did, he cooked for long hours. You called him the chef, and forced everybody to moan while eating his food. Then at nights, you swallowed the rest by yourself. For hours, you chewed there, bare hands, leaning over the pots in the darkness. In the mornings, I behaved as if I hadn't noticed and ran away from you, beast. But your shiny child's eyes, green sparkling eyes, mama, oh mama, your head, always peeping from the little kitchen window, waiting, framed by the window's wooden lintel, as if it was the only place in which you could be. And so what if it was the window of the newest kitchen? And so what if the doorkeeper nodded, hello, madam, when you entered or left the cave? And so what if it was in the middle of the city, with a car, with a gym, with expensive shoes and silent modern pop music in the weekends? You were rotten. How can I explain? You, how can I explain? You listened for hours to his stories. Three hours he talked in the car, family trips, sitting in the front, a father, a mother, sweating in the back. I was there, shutting up, because now he is telling you his stories, and you love you, love him, you love that, and you laugh, you laugh loud, you laugh brown, and you agree with him and you curse anyone who'd go against him. Sometimes so loud you curse that he tells you, calm down, and says your name. How can I explain the moment when he tells you, calm down, and says your name? How can I explain his quiet voice? It was like a fist blow in your face. How can I explain? You took care of everything. Cleaning, washing, house bills. He gave you compliments. Your mother is the best secretary that I know. And he had many, many secretaries. But your mother is the best. How can I explain? Every time he said that, our cave was flooded with blood. Our rooms, our beds, how can I explain, collapsed into themselves. We were tearing each other apart in the living room while he was out in the garden. We were spitting and shouting and scratching while he grasped his hands behind his back and had a talk with a neighbor about holiday destinations. We killed. We cursed, we saw the cave collapsing while he whis whistled a little melody in weeks. How can I explain? When he came back into the cave, we froze <coughs> and played for him his family again. His clothes smelling of laundry, you always washed them separately from ours. You washed his delicate shirts by hand and after you ran to the window to smoke, mommy, mommy. They all thought that I'd hate you. But they don't know about the way your slim ankles cling to each other on the sofa. They don't know your collection of ducklings on the bathroom's windowsill. They don't know your little fingers, holding the cigarette and then another one, and then another one. And I licked your nipples for 20 years, then got my inheritance from him. And I hugged him after he said, I worked all my life to give it to you. And I answered him, thank you, Daddy, when he tearful, repeated, all my life. And I answered, thank you, Daddy. How can I explain? You were there. I remember the glow on your face. When he gave me the key to, a, to my inherited apartment, when he said, Daddy loves you. I remember how you glowed, standing two steps behind him, your back half bent, your face blurred out as if you were a random passerby that was accidentally caught in the family's happiest moment. Your face was there, blurred behind him, in 
never return to a sharp expression again. Our modern life, our modern family. Look into the camera and say cheese. How good Papa smelled. How young he looked, how photogenic. Papa took care of his body, of his mouth, of his teeth, while yours fell out one after another. The cave filled with your teeth, Mama, as your mouth emptied and became this black, moldy hole officially known as you, 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 an old lady and not even 40. Why did you have to puke me out in your shape? How did you dare give me all this despair? How do you dare force me to your lips? Papa never kissed those lips. We agreed on that, a family decision. We gave you the cheek. Your cave, the warmth, the humidity, <laughs> rice with spice, and orphan spaghetti. Your food was always a family joke, like trying to say, Mama's a bad cook because she's a liberated woman. But how can I, how, but how can I explain? You were only that, tasteless rice, pale pasta, and extra bread. What could I do? I gorged on you until you were finished and ran the hell away. What does a 70-year-old woman have between her breasts that a 20-year-old doesn't? The hell away of this dark hole in which you were crawling, chameleon legs, around yourself in circles, and you'll never see me again. My mommy, my mutter sow. You discovered the world of emojis. Your eyes are glowing in front of your smartphone. Every night and every morning, messages, and they are full of yellow smiling faces and they are full of chicks toddling in a row, and butterflies, hearts. My mommy, look, that's my mommy. Two green lights, your eyes, two buried emeralds. Still, how can I explain? It was all your fault, it was all your fault, and I will leave you and take care of him. I must be the body and not the shadow. I must be life and not this forgotten rest. So I come to visit once a month or once a year, and all the way to you, my heart is beating. All the way, I want to tell you. So much I want to tell you. Then you open the door and my jaw locks. And my face freezes. And when your body is near me, how can I explain my voice? I don't recognize it when it's talking to you. So I raise it, and I raise it just to watch with tears how your two shining eyes are glowing now towards me listening now to me, and the loud voice is me, and the loud voice is now me. What to do? I am talking and talking, three hour long stories, talking and talking. Only before I leave the house, I suddenly stop and say, but how are you, Mama? Why do you never say anything? The day, that day, million years ago, when he took you for a walk, the moment, that moment when he said, Let's go for a walk when he had a good mood. We were all around him, happy. And he grabbed his keys, and you wagged your tail so happy, and you were already close to the door, jumping on his legs. You were, and we, and he. He looked at you, at you, and he said, Do you remember how he said, with this low voice of his, with a slight, relaxed smile, do you remember how he suddenly said, how he... Aren't you ashamed, he said? Aren't you ashamed to go out, to show yourself in public like that? Your face, he said, and said your name. Look at your face, he said, and said your name. How can you allow yourself modulation? I was the wall, I was the wall, I was the empty eyes, I was the hole. I drowned in the blood at once, and I will never pop out again. And if I will, I swear that I will torture you, Mama, unless you take now the key that he's holding, <coughs> his expensive car key, unless you take it and stab him in the center of the forehead. We are suffocating. Take the key, Mama, save us. Take it, take us, and I'll come with you anywhere. Let us run away anywhere you want, Mama. Just say where, I'll come, I will. And we'll be a family, just us, together. I will never leave you, never. Modulation. Simple. Let's leave him there. With his fancy car key stuck in his brain, we can take your car, drop down. You always got his old car. When he got a new model, you always got his old phone. When he got a better one. Mama, we have to go. Believe me, let's go. 
and I will never leave you. Just take the key. You turned back and went to the cave of bathroom. You applied two stripes of brown red lipstick on the gray chameleon lips. You didn't look at the mirror when you did it. Then you crawled back to the door where he was standing, watching you. Do you remember, Mama, how he was looking at you? We all saw what he saw, a chameleon with brown red lips crawling on the house floor, parts of you crumbling to piles on the endless journey between the bathroom and his feet. Under his gaze, you crawled naked as in front of a gun, wig to the pile on the left, clothes here on the pile to the right, shoes. Mama, his gun, his gun that is pointing at you, just flip it back to his direction. Turn it back at him and I'll come with you anywhere and live with you forever. The long, long braid is entwined between me and my queen mommy. What do you call a gynecologist of a grandma archaeologist? And what does a grandma's hymen spider net news? News, train news, end of news, end of the news, end. Your hole from which you farted me out, that old sewage hole, that hole, that trash can hole. What did you do to me? What did you do to me? How did you dare do that to me? Morning prayers. And the day is over, and all the women are coming back from the canal towards the center of the city. And all the passerbys are standing aside for them because one, they should, two, they really should, and three, because all the people in the street are moving to the other side in order to see from where the deep voice that is filling the neighborhood comes from, from which route that voice that is filling the streets now comes from where, and they can't see her, but her voice is thundering loud as she screams her prophecies from above, rapping them hard, spitting her words of anger while her escort boys hum behind her, uh, and whistle around her, ha, ah, and once in a while, less and less it happens, but still, old papas try to climb up to the roof on which she stands and reach her, and they hurl horse curses towards her, shut up, clueless girl style, and they complain about her topics, and they despise her language, and the way she deals with complicated questions, learn the subject before you speak. Their faces become red to the loud laughter of the sisters, the sisters all around. Where is your certificate? Where were you trained to sing in public? They mumble under their uncombed Grandpa Trump wigs. Then the rapper stops. Oh, yes. She shifts into the frequency that will shut their ears down forever, because all around her now, the girls are preparing to join. Your time is over, old man. Your time is over, and we got the guns. And now listen to the witches. Listen to the witches that are moving the clouds and spreading purples all around. Colors of the night and the spirals. Listen. Listen to them. It's the final station and everything is moving. Breathing in and breathing out. Pumping the wind from north to south, from the sea to the lake. And the winds, mint green winds, the gentle breath of a woman, the calmness, the mint. The city is full of it. And this is where we're going to stay. This is where we're going to be while sweet honey rain falls on our faces. The ejaculation of relief. It's the end. It has arrived. And here, estrus howlings rise from the retirement home's windows. The dark middle is behind. The dark night of the deep middle. The deep, dark middle of a tunnel, of a story, of a body is behind. The dark night of a cheap train ride is over. Now the last stop has arrived, and the train is still. And nine queens now slowly stand up, straightening their joints. And this time, nobody looks at them. And nobody smiles at the sight of nine old bodies 
or nine dried goats, or nine silly cows, or nine hysterical chickens, or all the names you ever gave us, nine, six, five, no. One woman is standing now, all alone. She enters a three-dimensional squared picture, a three-dimensional dream, and doesn't belong to anyone's gaze anymore. And she's going to the bars, and she's dancing in the clubs, or she's paddling in salt bathtubs with glasses of cheap whiskey in her hand, with her boobs hanging out of her suit. Now no one is looking at her anymore. And this is the exact moment to lift the skirt and roll down the underwear. This is the time to bend in the middle of the street and pee everything out. And pee it in golden swarms and flood the pavements and storm the roads as it was a very long ride in this train. And she really needed to pee. And no way, no, no way that she will stand now in the endless line for the ladies' toilet while men's toilets are always free and empty. So. This is how the picture will pause, with the sharp smell of female piss. <laughs> and with you to bless, you are lying on your back, you, your eyes closed. It's just a kidney stone operation, it's no drama, the nurse mumbles. Still, this bed makes you so tiny, dumb. Next, but my mother, my mother, listen, it's my mother, waking up now from a deep anesthesia, all alone. Come close, says the black, humid hole in the middle of your face. Come close to me, the box with your teeth twitching between my hands. Come. Your gums move pink as baby's gums. Come to me, the sun is rising. You are stoned, mama. Don't talk, you need to sleep. Mama, mama, mama. Come to me, my darling, you say. Hug me, give me a kiss, you say. Give me a kiss, my love. On my mouth, you say. You need your teeth, mama. Mama, 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 you're stoned. Mama, mama, let me give you your teeth. Just put them in and go to sleep. Mama, you're stoned. It's morning. I got to go now. Sleep. Thank you again, and this is Tina, the director, Tina Sarah. <laughs> and uh, maybe we ask Sivan to come uh, with us, and Tina, is someone from the company coming, or just us? Oh, okay. So, um, we should have a soon so um, first I think again it was quite an extraordinary reading and uh, I was <laughs> so again really an applause for, for the work uh, with the actor that was really fantastic thank you, thank you. and um, Stephen how does it feel to hear uh, your play uh, in English in New York um, yeah only only while listening like to this reading I realized that I never heard this play in English yet um, only when I'm reading it in Berlin, sometimes in English, so I, I hear myself reading it and I know my rhythms and I know my, like, my attitude towards the text, so it was very touching. Where does the play Wait, come from? Did you translate it yourself? Uh, no, I wrote oh, okay. it. 
But someone else translated it. wrote it in English. Oh, you wrote it in English. Okay, well, that got it. But you don't hear it in Germany, they do it in German. Like, you said you never hear it in English, yeah. because there they do it in... So basically my texts are written in English and they are functioning as kind of ghosts because they are immediately being translated into German. I have a translator that works with me and in a way I already imagine them in German but I write them in English but my mother tongue is basically Hebrew. So like this uh, strange original is um, at least till now like always like somewhere like functioning in a way as a ghost like hidden somewhere in my, cool. yeah. in my drawer. Sorry to interrupt. I just was really curious because I of that. It was in English and then, okay, so <laughs> go on. <laughs> Anything else you were curious? Uh, lots more, but you should do your questions. That one was, I just wanted to clarify <laughs> no, at this point. I mean, I don't know, but I, Frank can start with his, yeah. Well, tell us, where does the play come from? So what was on your mind when you wrote it? <laughs> 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 well, ba basically when the, when we started to work on this piece in Gorky Theater, I remember that Sherman said, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we were, we were uh, deciding to work, um, to speak about the, the female body and the aging of the female body. Um, we didn't know really what's going to happen. And I remember that Sherman said, yeah, but you know, Sibylle Berg that is going to show here, like I think tomorrow, um, Sibylle Berg is going to, 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 to write a play about mothers and daughters, so maybe not, don't come close to the mother's topic. And I was like, yeah, of course, <laughs> and I, no way, no, I don't have my mother in mind. So this is how it started. <laughs> um, so um, how do you write, how is your process? Um, do you write, I think you said last night, you, you sit um, in your, at your home, you have a typewriter, you you uh, put in your computer, how does it work? Do you read it out aloud? Um, basically, I have um, a practice that I'm um, holding like in the last three years. Uh, every morning I meet myself at the same hour, 6.30, between 6.30 and 7, and uh, I start to write. And I do it every day until two o'clock or three o'clock at noon, no one calls. If someone calls, I don't answer. Um, and I just, uh, in a way, spill myself out. I meet myself, I call it to meet myself every day, no matter what. And um, this is how, when I, when I have already a specific work in mind, so I just start to walk around the topic and to just circle it until suddenly one day I, c I might find a queen in my way and then another queen and another queen and then I discover that I'm sitting in a train and uh, then I already have a situation. Um, and when I have a situation and a figure within a situation uh, or within a figure in a space and I can start constructing a situation, then it's endless. Then basically the form of theater only interrupts me because I would, can write forever. And well, we here and mostly are used to the well-made play, the British play of with the beginning and the middle of an end and characters and their emotion. Whatever. This is of course is a very different narrative structure you created. And so, um, do you don't believe in uh, the well-made plays? <laughs> um, well, I don't know if it's connected to belief, but more, um, I think, to a way of um, understanding and speaking uh, the human mind. Uh, this is how I hear it. I think that I prefer to create um, um, a braid somehow or carpets and to somehow um, 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 braid them into um, uh, uh, narrations that are intertwining with one another and um, um, reflecting or be like re um, being used as mirrors for one another or microcosmos for one another. 
And uh, this is what interests me, I think. I'm not so interested with uh, um, telling or using a plot because me, myself, I, I don't see the world as plots. I see the world as a spiral. Um, I see um, uh, topics or problematic topics in society uh, reflecting each other as we are, as if we are in a spiral. So this is how I prefer to write. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe uh, since we talked about uh, weaving, I think it's be sure. wonderful, beautiful work, and the complexity I think of the world is reflected in it, and it's not the simplified kind of children-like stories often stories get framed into. But how, how, how did you look at it when you got the text? How did that weaving look yeah. to you? I have one question. Is it a part three of something? It's a part of a tetralogy. And um, this tetralogy, and Papa Lip, uh, Daddy Loves You is the third part of it. And it was its own full length standalone, and then it was part of the trilogy. Okay, I didn't know what the part three was, but I was fine to sort of let that just be a mystery. Um, wait, what, Frank, you asked me what I, how I well, first you approached looked at it, it. You know, how did you approach it? What did yeah. you see in the play? I mean, I like read it through. It worked. Yeah, and there, I thought there was jokes embedded in it, in a real, to me, in this amazing way. Like there'd be this pretty rot text and then I could see the humor coming through it. Um, and I actually didn't know it called for 12, like it was supposed to be 12 women on a train <laughs> until I saw the description for this event after I'd already started working on it. But I was taking sort of like that first list, the me, they, like I saw that there were like, to me for the purposes of this, I'm like there's five things get denoted there. So five people will take on this braid, like move through this, like braid this text together. Um, which I think, because there's an amazing braid reference in that text itself, so that it's feels really It's my tattoo neat. as well. Ah, yeah. little, oh yeah. Daddy loves you. Oh, so it's, it's amazing, hand drawn kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it was, I mean, I, it was, it was a, it's a play, I mean, to, this would take a lot of time to me because the resonance is, because I love that it's not a normal plot and that really works with how my brain, I mean that, this feels way more true to what emotionality <laughs> and connection and memory actually are and well-made plays try to box that up into some prescribed social thing that's not even right in the first place, right? So this is like much more real feeling. But it then requires a lot of like, what? how do you bring out resonances? How do you stage this? How do you then track energy in a room? For, for me, my approach to something like this, to call that out, and that requires a lot more time than could be really done for something like this. But, so then it was like in a quick way, what kind of clear reading and, and like approaches that are simple to do and put onto it allow to feel where the text moves between itself and where whatever kind of relationships the varying speakers less on the page because I didn't have time to fully do that sort of work frankly but the speakers that once we I came to sort of an intuition around in the these five speakers of this text what becomes their relationships and how do we break that up based on a logic we just created that I put on it, then tr tested out with them, and then very quickly were like, okay, made a few small changes. So it was just making the world of it for literally to be here and put its own, and that's what it, I mean, potentially it could be the wrong logic, but we, it, that sort of play really allows so much space for a new logic to be braided into it. And by logic, I just mean something that holds it so the six of us could communicate in order to present that today. You know what I mean? I feel like we knew at least what we were doing in the fast time we work on it, so. Yeah. Siva, how, how did you see the reading? What, how, what came thr through to you from? Um, I'm always fascinated. I, I, I saw like uh, Daddy Loves You in uh, already a few versions. And for me, it's always fascinating and uh, somehow even difficult to see like a new body that is carrying this shame and expressing this, uh, the, 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 this stench that comes out like as a result of holding shame for so many years. Um, uh, it always touches me and uh, I, always, uh, I, I always cry as well uh, because, um, and for me somehow the indication, uh, the actresses in Gorky, they always tell me, I, we can't invite our mothers to this piece. Like you, your mother, is, your mother is in Israel, she doesn't understand a word from the piece that is like really being played in Gorky once a month 
at least in German. So she would never understand the word. But our mothers want to come. Um, and I say that I feel that this is the right, the right way to stand on this stage with this play, if you're really afraid that your mama will, will be there. <laughs> if you will have to look at her and say it and... The epigraph is really incredible. Always land next to your mother. That is the beginning of the play. Yeah, we all. Well, as soon as we read that, everyone felt like they really knew that, that was a little map. And this is a way. quote by Sasha Mariana Zaltzman. It was like you try. You think that you're going to write about something, but you always lie and land next to your mother. <laughs> very, very, very <laughs> true. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah. Um, before we come to audience questions, just uh, what do you, why do you, why do you write for theater, and what do you think theater can do? Um, I think that I um, uh, I think that I will try not like I will try to 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 to, to write prose soon as well. Uh, because sometimes I feel that theater, just the fact that we are sharing time and space, and I can't, I don't feel, I don't share like this genie idea of like taking for hours of people's time. Like I really do somehow don't do it uh, because I don't like always to experience it unless it's like extraordinary important. Um, but um, I really think that I live and breathe and think theater because I write for a space, for a body, for um, a quiet audience, and I write in this, like into this conflict that is like lying in between them. Um, I really think that uh, when I'm so cut, like when I'm writing, I speak all the time, as you you, see, you asked that before. Um, I think that I'm writing into the mouth and into the, the brain of the actress or the actor, and by that I really try to um, to create a certain relationship, like between a nude body, an exposed body on stage, and like a well dressed, well covered by darkness audience mm -hmm. that is sitting somewhere. And this nudity I see as a weapon and uh, as a way to resist. And um, this is something that I can't achieve, like with just writing to, to a page and communicating, you know, everyone that will communicate with me through the, so like somewhere on a sofa. This is a kind of a, of a jail. We want to escape. Everybody want, like thought, ah, maybe I will leave. Like maybe I will just like go and leave. But no, basically it's hard to leave. It's like an action. <laughs> it's performative. You will be the one that stands and like, <laughs> And all the men here, for example, yeah, it's like I will be like the papa that goes and everybody, <laughs> <laughs> like with this, it becomes performative, <laughs> me staying or me leaving. Uh, it's a jail that we share. And uh, <laughs> I like to be in these days where I don't really believe that people really read, uh, at least most, I think most of the people don't read anymore books. So I like to be in the space and make sure that they listen. <laughs> yeah, I think Thomas Brush, the German writer, said they should be just nailed to the wall. <laughs> they should not be allowed to leave when it gets complicated. But maybe uh, Michael uh, put some light up and uh, uh, on the audience, and uh, we um, also take some questions um, from you. We don't want to steal too much time, um, just because we always have great, great audiences here at the Grad Center, the Siegel Center. And maybe say briefly who you are. We have a microphone because we're also live streaming it through HowlRound, which is the great national organization that supports theater. So thank you. And um, please maybe say your name. Uh, my name is Judy. Um, uh, thank you for, um, I really enjoyed it. By the way, as someone who is probably your mother's age, I am going to tell you that you should definitely invite your mother. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I would not kill my child if I heard this. But all right. Um, so I, I, I just really have a, a question. I mean, you said your native um, or your mother tongue is Hebrew, so I'm wondering why you did not write it in Hebrew, and I'm wondering if it was if it has been translated into Hebrew. Um, no, of course not. It will not be translated to, to Hebrew. Um, 
because somehow I believe in killing my darlings, but like in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so without them knowing about them, <laughs> like they're dead, but they don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Like with the language, I guess that I, it's, it's a question that I deal with uh, constantly. Um, I think that uh, if and when I will write prose, uh, I will try to, to deal with Hebrew again, which is not so easy for me these days. But um, for theater, like um, the area of, of battle, of, the, this, the, of, of, of conflict, the, of urge, uh, this space that is on fire and is based on, the, on like this tension, um, I somehow like always to add my struggle with the language into this, um, into this uh, equation and like to just um, f fight and be vulnerable in front of the language as well. So basically I don't think that I write like with fancy verbs and more with uh, images and rhythms. I write music and um, and uh, I think that by writing in English, I'm somehow getting far from cliches of, um, and from habits and decorative habits of, um, that are appearing in my writing when I write in Hebrew. As Beckett said, exactly as he said, um, it's like better to write far from, from, this ha from your habit mm -hmm. uh, than your, and, you find yourself like in a place that is vulnerable enough. Mm. And like, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Another question or, or comment? Then and then you, uh, first, yeah, and then. Mm -hmm. um. Yes, I'm also your mom's age. <laughs> I'm a writer myself, and it's very awkward to write things, personal things, that even my children, I mean, I have the same problem that you have, wanting to expose and really use a language to say things that you're not supposed to say, you know? I think it's an obligation as a writer. You have to break, you have to break that contract with uh, f politeness and just get through it. So I th think it's marvelous that you're choosing a second language like and um, that's one comment. And the use of incantation was really that carried us. It was almost like a liturgy, but it wasn't a Hebrew liturgy. It was more like a Latin liturgy, which was quite interesting. So. Um, I just wanted to say that I think sometimes that uh, the language or the, the writing in, the, in, in English, um, it functions. I think for me as a second veil, and sometimes I think that I hide it from myself. I write and I'm like not paying so much attention because it's in English. It's not like digging in me, like Hebrew is digging in me and my ability to pass my borders is somehow higher. Like I, I, I just don't, don't notice it at the moment. Yeah. No, I think we go. Uh, hello, um, Aaron Magschloff. Uh, when you saw it on stage for the first time, how did it look compared to how you envisioned it? Um, uh, to say the truth, like I'm, I'm not so busy with um, Im imagining stages and stagings. Um, I'm really not, um, not so, uh, I mean, now um, an artistic director uh, from Zurich, from like she told me, you know, I think that your text is a stage already. Like your text doesn't really need a stage. It can be nice sometimes to add a s stage, and like you know, some would make it more situative. Some will make will make it completely abstract. Uh, but in a way, I agree. Like the text functions already like as a full world, and then what you add is great for me. Like unless it's Total crap, but like in general, it's okay. And um, in Gorky, I think the adaptation was um, um, like this: the stage and the staging was um, um, 
somehow yeah abstract but it was like another um, another another piece of this braid that they added like they add they put like the, these eight chairs that are half hospital chairs half um, urban train trains um, chairs and um, like they worked with fluorescence so great yeah for me it was good <laughs> I don't care for me it's really not the topic it's more how will these bodies stand and be completely naked in front of an audience of a hundred and something people that are all their mothers and their fathers and how to speak to those fathers so they will so they will listen what will happen so this is for me what's interesting and what's important all the rest yeah this is why i'm not directing i guess <laughs> see what see what is a real play i played while he says who needs directors i have the text uh, yes which is very unbullied and gurky uh, that shows the variety i think also of, of, of that place um any else yeah um, I really loved it. I found it to be quite devastating um, in many different directions. And um, one of them was the utopic visions that you put forth were so powerful. And I almost felt like they were spells. And I feel like it's really important because they sort of set us free into this... Um, a better vision for ourselves and then so that when you take us into the depths of what reality can become and sickness and um, codependence or whatever I mean I'm sure we're all I know I was projecting my entire <laughs> mother-daughter relationship onto what I was listening to it um, it hits us so much harder um, Anyway, I just wanted to say that, but I was so curious about the tunes, and they were so specific. Oh, also, thank you for bringing Rosemary Quinn in to read for that, oh, because... she was great. Oh, my Where God, Rosemary, Rosemary, Jesus. Thank you so Jesus. much. Um, uh, it was so, yeah, so fresh. It destroyed me, but it almost, they were so, the tunes were so specific, I almost felt like they were reading from sheet music. <laughs> and I wondered how, how did you all do it? Well, having Rosemary was a real gift and pleasure. So that, I'm very glad that was just noted. Um, and very perfect with this text, which we, you know, figured out in a very short time together. But um, how, how truly perfect she was. Um, the, um, there was, the opposite of sheet music was what was used. Um, but the actor, Eleanor, who first sang um, Sitting op Opposite Rosemary, she, I had just worked with her on something and knew she had this really beautiful voice. So in these very little limited hours, I used the por first portion of that was bringing just her in. And the sections that I thought could be sung, having her just do it. And it and I knew I was going to be and wanted it to be just very simple and earnest. And then with the potential that some of these other non-singers could then add in potentially a similar thing in this experimental version of what we would try with this. So she sort of, she established this tone and I was like, that sounds very right for the simplicity of this first thing. And so I'm glad to hear and you. Written in this, sorry to keep asking, but... Yeah. Um, Well, it, those sections call, are called the Queen singing, or the Queen's singing. Yep. What, what did you What did you have in mind? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, actually, in the beginning, when they started to sing, I was like, Oh no! Oh my God! What are they doing? <laughs> and um, <laughs> I was like, Each time, you know, <laughs> it's always, and it, it, no one will understand. No one will listen to the. And then suddenly, it caught me, like, like really, like dragged me by the hair, like back into the room. And um, suddenly, I understood that I wrote the Queen's <laughs> singing. Like for me, it was like a lament. For me, it was like a prayer. For me, it yeah. was like, but just a kind of a. Yes, yeah. uh, it's something that I put in the title, and I thought that it's cool. And <laughs> and something I found that it did ultimately do for me 
with these braids was like when the music would go out, we could then, I could then hear the next text in a different way. And since we weren't gonna have this staging, and I, I wasn't gonna try to do it on mics or anything, I was like, it allowed a bit of dynamics in the text, even separate from what singing means. Like when Rosemary would come in at a certain part, at, you know, that was what we tended to a little bit more than other places of like, actually don't sing that line, come in here, because it started to have Again, it's logic of what made sense to relieve the singing at a certain point and go back to just hearing the text, which potentially if you just had heard the wash of text, to stick with that in a certain way with how fast we were going to work on it. Yeah. Uh, we think we're getting closer to the time the next, we have the next six to the reading, but uh, Sivan, what are you working on now? What's, what's, what's in your mind what, in future projects? What, or what would you love to do if you could do whatever you wanted at the Gorky? Well, in general, I do whatever I want at the Gorky. I really, like, no, really. So they what, just I, allow, they're just, uh, when, like, they just ask what would be the next topic, and it's completely open and free, mm -hmm. uh, topic-wise, and of course, form-wise. Uh, now I finished to write uh, a new play that is called uh, Love, uh, an argumentative uh, exercise, and um, it's my first play ever about love. I never wrote about love in my life, not as a teenager and not as an adult. Mm -hmm. So now I started. Um, and it's going to be staged in September, but in a different theater. So what did you discover when you wrote about love? Something you can share? Um, well, basically, I meditate um, around the characters, the figures the, um, of uh, Popeye the Sailor Man and Olive Oil. And um, I analyze their uh, relationship, and I say, like, it's a love and argumentative exercise as experienced by Popeye the Sellerman, seen by Olive Oil, written by Sivan Benishai. And um, <laughs> then, basically, I, I start to, with a few facts about Popeye the Sellerman, but then, of course, I spiral and start to dig into Olive Oil. Uh, her figure, her character, as represented, like as, w as we know it, the relationship, and then into her mind. It was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was a <laughs> difficult one. <laughs> Good. Well, if you, anybody travels to Berlin, if one can see it, I'm sure in the, in the fall. It will be in Mannheim, but in yes, Mannheim? Okay. we can. Okay. Good. Because, but it will come there, I'm sure. Again, uh, I think a big applause for the direction for writing that uh, beautiful song and prayer uh, about meditation, about fathers, mothers, children, and, uh, and, and to all the actors. I think it was really a wonderful reading. Thank so. you for the actresses. <laughs> and, uh, and Thank <laughs> you. 